Hello, and welcome to The Way. Thanks for joining us online. We still want to help you connect, grow, and serve in this season. Our online belong circles are continuing to meet, and they're an important point of connection in this season. Even if you haven't been a part of one, please join. We all need a place to share and process. You can visit our website, thewayberkeley.com. Find Grow on the menu bar and then select Belong Circles. You'll see all of our current groups. Click on the one you're interested in to connect with the leader. They'll add you to the email list and send you a Zoom link for the gathering. Also, we're hosting a daily devotional at noon, Monday through Saturday. Jump onto our Facebook page and hang out with us for 15 or 20 minutes. In this season of increased stress and anxiety, we want to provide a daily place to get centered, feel connected, and focus on God. So join us each day at noon on The Way's Facebook page. And even though there's a lot going on, we want to encourage all of you to take this time to fill out your census form. You can fill it out online at my2020census.gov. You should have received something in the mail that has your 12-digit ID. That's how you log in. And only one person has to complete the census for everyone in the household. It's so important that every one of us be counted. Census results are used to allocate seats and draw district lines for U.S. House of Representatives, state legislature, local boards, and the census is used to distribute over $800 billion annually in federal assistance to states and cities and families. They guide community decision-making that affects schooling, housing, and health care services, and so much more. Historically, African-American households have been undercounted, but let's not let that happen this year. Take a few minutes and be counted. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us here at The Way online. speak to our hearts. And so Ezekiel chapter 37 will be the place where we spend our time of preaching today. Uh, if you know anything about Ezekiel, it is one of the major prophets uh, of the biblical text. Uh, it is one of these particular passages that uh, give you and I a great sense of the divine imagination at work uh, with God in God's direct engagement with an oppressed people. That, as a matter of fact, uh, when we find ourselves in great times of challenge and great times of difficulty, God does not desire to leave us to our own capacities. <clears throat> but as a matter of fact, God wants to invite you and I into a radically uh, new way of seeing and experiencing the world. And so uh, Ezekiel is a prophet who was called literally during the time of uh, the people of Judah's exile. He, they were uh, overran by their enemies in Babylon, and uh, they had a series of deportations, if you will. Uh, folks were being led from their own country into exile in another country. And it is thought that Ezekiel was actually in the first wave of deportations, meaning that he was in that first wave of of folks that, that were taken into captivity. And while he was in captivity, Ezekiel began to move and be called into a ministry of prophetic impact. And um, it's always important to appreciate that, you know, to these days we always got a lot of folk who claim to be prophets. And uh, we, we reduce prophetic ministry to the foretelling of the future. Uh, folks telling you uh, almost like a fortune teller about how much money you're going to get and who's going to be your boo and, 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 and a house and a car is coming. But uh, I believe certainly if this moment has taught us anything, uh, I wonder where were all the prophets who saw 
uh, coronavirus coming. Amen. Uh, that, as a matter of fact, to be a prophet is not uh, fully described or, or predominantly defined by the ability to see the specificities of someone's future. But it is indeed about our ability to declare with definitiveness to the people of God our covenant responsibility and to be called back into rightful living in that regard. And so Ezekiel chapter 37 is a word from the Lord being spoken to Ezekiel for the people who were at their lowest moment. And may these words continue to be a source of strength and inspiration for us. Ezekiel 37, uh, verse number one says, The hand of the Lord was on me, and the Lord brought me out by the Spirit and set me in the middle of a valley. Lord, have mercy. Uh, that, 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 that's, a, that's a mouthful. That the hand of the Lord was on Ezekiel, and the Lord through the Spirit brought him into the middle of a valley. And this valley was full of bones. And he led me back and forth among the bones. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And the Lord asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. What an amazing gift of Scripture. Verse 6, I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Oh, the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us all say thanks be to God. So, so Ezekiel 37, uh, we've read verses 1 through 6. I want to speak from the topic for the next few moments, lamenting bones and resurrecting spirits. Lamenting bones and resurrecting spirits. Let's just pray, God, we ask you to bless the word of God. That has been read for us, the people of God, and we ask you to hide your word in our heart so we will not sin against you. And please let the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy may rest on me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way everywhere say amen. amen. Just in your comments, just type the title of this message just to let us know you're there. Lamenting bones and resurrecting spirits. Lamenting bones and resurrecting spirits. Now, as of this morning, over 660,000 individuals globally have contracted what we now know to be the coronavirus. And over 30,000 have reportedly died. In the U.S., we now are the leader in the world of known, confirmed, positive tests for the virus hovering at around 120,000 people. And this week, our numbers have now crossed the 2,000 number of those who have transitioned and succumbed to the coronavirus. And if you are uh, connected to folks all across the country in different pockets, uh, we are starting to now feel the direct impact and loss of life. We now all of us, I think, know a family member or a friend who not only has tested positive, but some have found themselves hospitalized. Some have found themselves hospitalized and not 
able to recover are and are hovering in ICU and others have succumbed. There have been bishops in our denominational spaces, pastors and, and moms and principals and police officers and teachers uh, have unexpectedly died because of this crisis. And we have no end in sight as of yet because we are told that an estimated millions of people in our country will test positive. And very much so, we are hearing and expecting that depending on our success or failure related to social distancing measures, a significant number of the millions may indeed need hospitalization. And those who are then hospitalized may not survive their illness. We are living in perilous times. And we can certainly point to this truth that although all death is inevitable, many deaths can indeed be pushed back further. Because of the inept and egomaniacal, egomaniacal leadership of Donald Trump and his Cinco fans and and, and, and these folks that don't know what they're doing. We don't have the necessary resources that are stockpiled. As a matter of fact, we know now that we need ventilators and we need masks and we need protective equipment, as they say, for our frontline workers. We need more hospital beds. We need tests for all of us to be able to check our status. And, and, and the medical personnel, even themselves, are starting to be strained because more and more people are coming up sick and diagnosed with this illness. I read this week that in the US, uh, we have about 160,000 ventilators that are already being used. And another recent study said that we may need upwards of 960,000 people who will need the use of ventilators. This is where our Lenten journey has brought us. As we enter the penultimate week leading into Palm and Passion Week, literally we find ourselves walking through the shadow of death. Walking through the valley where we are surrounded by all kinds of real life expressions of loss. And the lectionary text that we have been given as we make our Lenten journey gives us both comforting and dreaded language in that the Spirit is leading us. How comforting. But the Spirit leading us is taking us into a valley of dry bones. The Spirit leading us. Isn't that our prayer? That, God, I want you to lead me. We sing a song, Lord, if you lead me, I will follow. Amen. You, 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 you know, obviously, uh, you, you would probably confess that, God, if you're leading me, I must be doing something right. I'm not going on my own direction but I'm actually following your leadership. <clears throat> but we know that there are times where we will be led into a valley of dry bones. Yes, we are in a valley. And yes, the valley is filled with dry bones, but let us not erase the fact that the spirit is indeed leading us. Just like a GPS would lead us through whatever journey we're on. We are being led by the Spirit. Oh, just say that I am being led by the Spirit. Uh, just type that, I am being led by the Spirit. Now, Lent is indeed a season of journey and preparation for the follower of Jesus who is in keenly aware that resurrection is just as real as the cross that will precede resurrection. That for many of us, it is a time as we go through Lent where we must reckon and wrestle with the enthusiasm we will have for resurrection. All the while, we 
we also have a sense of dread and a lack of preparation for the crucifixion. That indeed we look to resurrection, but we want to skip the crucifixion part. Isn't that our nature, right? We, we, we want the payoff, but we don't always want to go through the process where the payoff leads us to. While we are able to rightly name the anger and the fear and the pain caused by the lack of preparation by our political and global leaders to this crisis that has caused needless death and suffering, I want you to also ask yourself as we walk through the valley, what equipment do I lack myself to endure this journey? Do you have the necessary ventilators that will breathe life into your broken spirit? Do we have the necessary protective gear that we need to guard our hearts and our minds so we don't lose hope? Do you have the testing kits that will help determine your character in this moment? that will reveal how inclusive or exclusive we will be when we start to feel the walls of despair closing in on us. If you're like me, I'm learning where my deficiencies lie. I'm learning that the things I thought I should prioritize are no longer as important as they should be. I'm learning that I have to do a quick uh, equipment check. I need to check my equipment to make sure that I have what I need in order to get through this trial. Just pat yourself on the chest and say, I need to do a quick self-check. I need to do a quick self-check. And this self-check is so important for you and I because last week we talked about the limits we have in our humanity that sit right alongside and often reveal the supernatural power that is within us and that is with us and that you and I should look to our past, lean into our present and look to the future. The, these concepts that we talked about last week, I think were a very helpful and important opportunity for us to take inventory about where we are. And the more I've thought about that this week, I've, I've, I've continued to think about the human limitations that exist for us that sit alongside these divine guardrails. These, these things that, that honor our human, our human limitations, but with great intentionality by our creator, continue to remind us that we don't have to go off the rails. That even in this struggle and even in this trial, that we have some support systems at our disposal. Some of that may be buried deep in the recesses of our faith, but I want you to know that you have a spirit-led GPS system that is at work within you, that is at your disposal. And the first question you must ask yourself, do I have the GPS system that can take me through this trial? Do I have the necessary equipment that I know to be indispensable? I thought my mortgage and my rent and, and the, the solutions for my housing uh, were, were, were things that were fixed. But now we know that with a radical rethinking of our political and economic order, everything can be changed. If the conditions are right, anything in your life can be changed. Oh, you ought to just encourage yourself that if the conditions are right in my life, everything, anything can be changed. I just need the right equipment up in here to help lead me through the process that requires my change and transformation. And, and as you ask yourself, what equipment do you need? I want you to also ask yourself, what needs can you fill? How can, as God gives you the equipment you need, you can also be imagining how you can fill a need 
around you. The Spirit leads Ezekiel into the wilderness. And, and we find then the, the power of this passage is expressed in the, the active engagement of God's Spirit through the very human laments of the people that eventually proclaimed a future hope that would follow the valley experience. And that's what I want to focus on for the next few moments, that the process of a future hope requires the lamenting of the bones and the looking for God's activity. That when the Spirit leads Ezekiel into the valley, it is there that he sees the bones. It is there that he sees what is characterized as death all around him. It is, in some writer's mind, an uh, 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 expression of Ezekiel perhaps being led through a battlefield and seeing the remains of his comrades and countrymen who had been defeated by their worst nemesis and enemy. And I can imagine Ezekiel walking through this valley and seeing those who he knew and loved, their bones, their, their remnants. And Ezekiel, in a moment of great desperation and hopelessness, was able to channel the very despair of his own people. And that when Ezekiel finds himself in the valley, it is indeed the case that he, being led by the Spirit, guaranteed that his valley experience would be temporary. That's one thing I want you to appreciate today. That no matter what valley you find yourself in, as long as the Spirit is your GPS, the Spirit can lead you through every nook and cranny of any valley you will face. And that is why I, I, this week I loved how Dr. Fauci, he, he said in his response to Donald Trump's declaration that Trump wanted to open the country up by Easter to return everything to normal. And that uh, in response to that, Dr. Fauci said that we should let the virus be our timeline. And, and I, I, I appreciated his, his, his correction to a, a, a half-baked president line of thinking that, that, that seems to want to return things to normal. May I add that we should never return to normal. That, that perhaps the, the normal that Trump wants is the actual abnormality that we are being asked to jettison as we go through the valley. And so while the virus may determine our timeline, I implore you people of God, keep the spirit as your guide. The, 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 the timeline may be dictated by the virus as it flattens, but how many of you know that as long as the spirit is my guide, then I will not return back to the normal that was the United States of America pre-corona. The normal that depends on racism and human hierarchy. Somebody holler, I won't return. The normal that exploits the poor and the vulnerable among us. Someone holler, I won't return. The normal that funds state-sponsored violence at home and abroad at the expense of education, housing, and food. Somebody holler, I won't return. The normal that has made our society and world so susceptible to immoral and wicked leadership may the Spirit never allow us to return back to that normal. If you are at home, I dare you just to write a few notes down of the normal you won't return to in your own life. Uh, as you go through this valley, maybe some of you need to say, I won't return back to that normal of self-medication. I won't return back to that normal of unhealthy healthy eating. I won't return back to that normal of, of being filled with, with doubt and, 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 and depression, but I am going to do all that I can to do a holy reset while I am in the valley. Oh, I, I want you to know that, that this passage then, it gives you and I a great, a dual purpose of lament and apocalyptic hope. 
and it is instructive. So as you do the first step of lamenting the bones, I want you to be reminded that it won't stop there. But we can rush past the lamenting of the bones. Everybody holler, lament the bones. Come on, say it again. Lament the bones. Now, the valley, though difficult, is made even more complicated by the bones that await the prophet, which would cause you and I to know that each valley we face has a distinctive nature to it, which should be responded to with a particular response rather than a general response. The bones in this valley that require lamenting should serve as a tutor for us who are related to what we must learn while we go through this valley. The bones in Jewish liter literature, when you study it, serves as a metaphor of describing the deepest self or the communal self of the people. It is the most essential part of them. They are not just bones in this text, but they are dry bones. They are disconnected bones. They are remnants of a lot of lost lives, not properly buried, not properly remembered due to the imperialism that left them wasted in the valley. These bones then become instructive for us while you and I want to rush through the valley of the bones, I want you to take a few moments and ask yourself, what does this valley of dry bones want to teach us? We must ask ourselves, our families and our societies, what has contributed to these dried up bones? And more importantly, what does our tradition as Jesus followers ask us to do in response to these bones? In the companion text for the lectionary, Jesus is seen visiting his friend Lazarus, who has just died. And Jesus comes into the situation, and he is observing all of the grief, the rightly uh, used grief that people are enduring because their friend Lazarus, their brother, their loved one has died. And Jesus' response to the people was not a cliche of faith. It was not a diminishing of their humanity. As a matter of fact, in the shortest verse of the Bible, we see the most vulnerable human response by Jesus. The scripture says Jesus wept. He lamented. He cried. He allowed his humanity to run its course. And as we are being led by the Spirit into these valleys. I want you to trust that the Spirit can hold your humanity while you lament the particularity of your valley. Yes, the Spirit has the ability to hold your lament while you go through the valley, that in this case, the bones you and I will lament over the next few days over the next few weeks, over the next few months, they are necessary for us to never return to normal. I want you to hear what I'm saying. The deaths aren't necessary, but the lament of the death is. We can help reduce the amount of death through our faithful participation in these admonitions coming from our public health uh, loved ones and experts, but we cannot avoid the lament that will come from the bones that we will be surrounded by. Because I want to argue if you don't lament the bones with intentionality, the grief from the bones will overwhelm and paralyze us. And you and I cannot afford to be overwhelmed and paralyzed by the grief and lament that sweeps us when we are not rightly processing through it in an intentional pace. And this is what I think is a terrible risk for the church right now, for us who are theologically and praxeologically not taking time 
to lead our churches through a lament of the bones. Resurrection is coming. Yes, it's coming. But you and I must also process our feelings and emotions healthily in this moment. Or we will be given to our worst selves. Doing things that we promised we'd never do again. While we're waiting for the resurrection to happen. I don't know if you've ever been waiting for something and, 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 and while you was waiting, you, you started picking up more bad habits than, than, that you have to drop off after the thing you were waiting for came. <laughs> Somebody say, man, you know, it's like I, I, I've been waiting for this thing a long time and then it shows up and, and now you got more baggage and you can't even really experience the greatness of the thing you were waiting for. A quick glance around us gives us a glimpse of a failed theopraxis at work in our society. A failed theology, an inadequate set of practices that don't allow us to process our laments and grief well. And that is why, while we are sheltering in place, domestic violence is springing up. While we are sheltering in place, self-medicating, with substances to numb our pain is shooting through the roof. People are standing outside gun stores, stockpiling weapons in a time where the enemy we must defeat, you can't kill with a gun. Asian Americans are being targeted with hate crimes as if they are the source of all this that is happening our elders, our loved ones with underlying health conditions are being offered up, it seems, in a public perverse form of a sacrifice on the altar of an already failing economy. It's because we have a theology and a practice that has failed us to help us lament the bones. Because of that, we are turning away into things that you and I know we must not fall into. I am someone who is every day now taking time to lament. Lament the foolish preachers who still trying to have church out here. Lament the, the hoteps on YouTube who peddle conspiracy theories about this crisis that, that seduce the simple minds and prove to be deadly to the least informed. I'm lamenting all of these Things that, that, that are named and unnamed. Why? Because as we go through the valley, you must take time to lament the bones. When your mental health is overrun, you should lament that. When the lives of those who are lost begin to intersect in your life, you should lament and grieve that. Because listen to this, I am convinced that these laments serve as a fertilizer for the soil that produces hope for us on the other side. As you lament, I believe the laments begin to fertilize the soil, which leads me to this next point of resurrected spirits which follow the lamented bones. This moment is giving us a chance to look forward to a resurrection that leaves the normal behind. And did not the scripture say that if we are in Christ, we are a new creation, that even right now, us who are in Christ are being made new through the process of this, this valley experience, this Lenten journey, as we get closer and closer to Passion Sunday, which will be next week, Palm Sunday next week, and Easter Sunday the following week, that this whole process being led by the Spirit into a valley filled with dry bones, they rightly deserve to be lamented, but we also must keep asking ourselves, God, in the midst of these bones and this valley, what are you asking me to see that I can't yet see? I'm asking God, help me in the midst of this valley to see the possibility of resurrecting spirits that are made fresh and possible by the Ruach 
the literal breath that comes from God. So I want you to hear this, that we are even at this moment being asked to see both death and life at the same time. That the prophet is inviting us to hold in a holy tension the dissonance of our experience and the divine imagination of resurrected bodies and spirits. That the prophet is asking us to imagine a sacred reconstruction of sorts, a sacred reconstruction of our bones, of those things that we are lamenting. The prophet by the spirit is also asking us to imagine that there will be a sacred reconstruction of our most deeply held beliefs and identity. That a reconstitution of a new way of life is made, uh, it's made possible by the spirit that will be placed within us, says the Lord. Yeah, that the prophet is, is, is telling us to call forward now the winds from the four corners of the earth to animate the dried up bones and bring back to life the fractured hopes of a people. Could it be that in this moment that you and I are being asked to reconsider where we think our winds are coming from? That many of us have gotten used to calling a certain wind to come and, and try and animate some bones and animate some bodies and animate some spirit. But, but those, those winds you're calling on are insufficient. They don't have the ability to, to, to animate and to resurrect these kind of bones. Uh, that, that, that your inadequate theology is insufficient. Your, in, your inadequate politics are insufficient. Your dead end vocations, they are insufficient. They are too easily manipulated by the wicked to serve the ends of death and not resurrection. The same question that was asked to Ezekiel is being asked to us, can these bones live again? Can the breath that you are calling forward can they bring these bones back to life? If your theology can't resurrect the bones, it's time to get a new theology. If your politics can't resurrect the bones, it's time to get a new political ideology. If your diet can't resurrect the bones, it's time to go on a fast and build a new food plan. If your attitude and disposition can't resurrect the bones, how many of you know it's time to get a makeover and believe that God can make you and I brand new? If your relationship relationships uh, and your money and your mind and your heart and your spirit can be resurrected uh, by the breath that you are breathing uh, then it's time to ask God Lord give me a new breath uh, give me a new spirit uh, I know we need to keep manufacturing new ventilation machines uh, that can bring new breath to the hospitalized uh, but I believe that God won't you and I as we go through this valley of dry bones Lord to give us a new ventilation practice for our spirit God I need your spirit to help me to breathe a new kind of breath I know we need to make more masks and I know we need to make more protective gear but I hear God saying oh, child of God do you have the protection you need to guard your heart and your mind put on the whole armor of God that you can be able to withstand the wiles of the devil that are coming against you and I. I want you to lament the bones, but I also want you to resurrect some spirits, knowing that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, it's at work in you and I. While you are in your home,
home while you are taking a walk around the lake while you are huddling with your family do your practice of lament but while you lament ask God breathe into me a new breath of life breathe into me a new ruach somebody said I need a new hit of that divine breath of God the breath that blew into nothing and something came forward that breath that blew over the face of the deep and things began to percolate that breath that blew into the body of the first humans and their bodies became a living soul I know we need a breath a breath that will give us a new heart I know we need a breath a breath that will give us a new mind breathe on me Holy Spirit breathe in my house breathe in my heart breathe in my marriage breathe give me a new breath give me a resurrected spirit give me a resurrected hope I may have to cry along the way but weeping may endure for a night but joy joy oh joy is coming in the morning shout hallelujah What does it mean in this moment to hold both the lament and the resurrecting breath of God together as a necessary tag team to get us through this valley of dry bones? We're not telling you to respond to the bones you see with religious cliches that aren't strong enough to hold the pain or despair you're feeling. Nor are we asking you to ignore the bones, to act as if the bones aren't there. No, we're asking you to take seriously that perhaps these bones are here because God is asking us to lament. God is asking us to tap into the four winds of the earth. Ooh, there may be some winds that you have not tapped into yet because those winds are not yet familiar to you. Maybe in this season, more prayer, more study, more disciplines, of engagement and abstinence can help you tap into a new kind of wind that will speak to our hearts, that will speak to our spirit. I know we sang this last week, but let's sing it again. Speak to my heart. Holy Spirit, send me a word. You're there in your home right now. I just dare you, I invite you to just stand where you are. If you're sitting, lift your hands, close your eyes. And let's just invite the Spirit of God one more time. God, I need to hear your word spoken so clearly. Speak to my heart, Lord. Speak, Speak to, to my heart. heart. Holy Spirit, give me the words that will bring new life. Words on the wings of the morn. So right where you're standing, right where you're sitting, God, we invite you right now, Lord, speak to us. Speak a word of life, a word of encouragement. Speak a word of truth to us, God. We don't want to come out of this valley going back to a normal way of life, the normal before the crisis. But what a great opportunity that is being afforded to us while everything is being upended, while all that we thought 
was indispensable, we are now being reminded that above all, life should be preserved. That every system should work for the people's well-being and not the people working for the system's well-being. That our churches must serve the saints and the community and not the other way around. That even our families and our relationships must be life-giving to us, God. I pray that this season will be an opportunity for us to reimagine life, reimagine hope, reimagine a new way of life. I pray for each person that is watching us online. I pray for their families. I pray for the health workers that are in our congregation, the nurses, the doctors, Lord God, who at, are at Kaiser and at Sutter and, and at St. Luke's and at General Hospital and all these, these highlands, all of these, these health institutions across this region. And God, I know that they don't have what they need and, and they are stretched beyond capacity. I pray, God, that even as they are enduring this season, I pray for your resilience and your perseverance and your divine protection. I pray for those family members, Lord God, who we are losing to this illness. Lord, I pray, God, that as we grieve and mourn them, Lord, may we be reminded that we are not a people who mourn without hope. That, God, the, 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 the death of the righteous are precious in your sight. And they are being welcomed into the church triumphant. And so, God, I pray that, Lord, these truths will comfort us even as we grieve, even as we lose those whom we love. We pray for, Lord God, our family members who are sick. I call out my brother's name. I call out, Lord God, the, our staff members here at the church whose family members are, are back and forth to the hospitals. I call out, Lord God, uh, 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 Sharice's grandmother. I call out all of the family members that we know, Lord God, who are even at the point of vulnerability. Sister Moni's, Lord God, Father. We call out all of these names. I don't know if there's some names that we want to just, just call out even right now uh, that have been lifted up. Prayer request names. Please, let's just call them out just for a few moments before. I just want to lift up Shanique LaFrance and Ginger Jones who lost loved ones. We want to... Um, Lift up Gloria. Gloria, lift up Shirley Edwards and Jackie Wilson. Uh, Brother Roderick's family was exposed to the virus, so we're praying for them. And, of course, we're praying for our houseless loved ones and individuals uh, who are without a home right now. While you're at home, just say, God, we believe you're able. Just say that. God, we God, believe we you're believe able. You're able. And if some of you are, 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 are drowning in some doubt right now, just respond like the, the young man did to Jesus. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. It's okay to say that. That's in the scripture. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Just proclaim that. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. God, I want to be praying for our health care providers. I want to pray for Dominique. I want to pray for Patterson, folks who are still going into work. Uh, even for Calvin, who's on the drums, who's still going into work, uh, people who are every day serving our communities, would you be providing them with the equipment that they need, yes, God? Lord. Would you be supporting them in their mental and emotional well-being? Would you also be protecting their families as they are not given the privilege of sheltering in place right now, God? Yes, I pray for our educators. I pray for Helen, Malaysia, folks I know who have been online for hours all week long trying to help our educators continue to support our kids and our communities, God. Would you give them the energy and the wisdom that they need in this time as they're really, their hearts are um, just grieving as they see the impact of this on uh, different ones of their kids, God, and on their teachers they're working with as well, God. Would you just give them encouragement that they need right now, Jesus? So, God, we ask you as we close, Lord, we lift up all of our incarcerated loved ones. We, I was just informed a few moments ago that uh, one of the... Uh, Loved ones incarcerated in Rikers uh, prison died today. Have mercy, Jesus. And so uh, Have mercy, we, Jesus. we're seeing uh, the death of our, our loved ones in jails and prisons starting to creep up. Uh, I was also just informed that Sharice's grandmother just passed it a few moments ago. Mercy, and so Jesus. we're praying for the Halford family and praying for Lady Sharice and Quinette and all of them who are here, who are certainly celebrating her transition to glory, but mourning. 
yes. uh, the loss of uh, her presence here with us. God yes. in real time. Yes, God. Yes. We are the being asked Jesus. to hold the dissonance yes, of loss and also the possibility and confidence of your hope and deliverance. Yes. So God, even right now, we ask you to speak to our hearts. Remind us that all will be well. Come in Jesus. the name of Jesus, we pray. Oh, we love Jesus. you, God. We thank you, God. We give your name the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Yes. Come on, let's thank God. Let's give God a quick Hallelujah. praise and a quick God. appreciation for all Jesus. that God you, is God. doing, God. for all that God will do. And we count it as done. In Jesus' name Jesus. we pray. Hey, hey. Speak to my heart. Hey, God. Speak to my heart. This is our prayer, Lord. Speak to our heart. Yeah, yeah. Speak to my heart. God bless you, people of the way. We love you so much. I pray this week you will find an opportunity to imagine that this is now this season where we are entering into some unknowns but we have some knowns as well that God is with us God is with you that God is leading us through this valley season we are not rudderless that even as we go through grief God is leading us even as we go through loss even as we head into dangerous places and spaces of vulnerability, God is leading us. And if God is leading us, then we will never be led astray. So have hope, have, have confidence, lean on one another, call and text one another. We have belong groups still happening this week. We have our daily devotionals. Check in every day at 12 o'clock on our Facebook page, our YouTube page, and let's experience some, some great expressions of faith of hope of prayer of celebration and we'll thank god for you we love you with the love of the lord in jesus name i do have one announcement for all parents parents of all our children at young and not ashamed yana ministry we will have a monday zoom call for all parents who are struggling or want to vent or need some advice on homeschooling, we have wonderful educators here at The Way. So um, this will go out to you in our email, in our website, in our Facebook. Look out for Monday Zoom call. Also on Tuesdays, we're gonna have Zoom calls for our kids on Tuesday. We're gonna have one for the K through third grade. We have one for ninth through 12 year olds. And then we have one for teens. So look out in, your, in our communications for Zoom calls for our young and not ashamed. We're gonna stay together in this. We love you with the love of the Lord. God bless you, everybody. Stay connected. God, we thank you for one more day, one more time of fellowship. We pray a special blessing and covering over all of your people. Thank you for all of those that gathered from all across this region, some across this state, even some across the country. Lord, may the bonds of our fellowship be always connected by the sweet communion of your spirit. And may we always be reminded that resurrection is on the way and death never has the final say. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you, everybody. Love the Lord this week.